Welcome to another episode of Persuasion, the Art of Feminine Negotiation. I'm your host, Cindy Watson, and I'm really excited to introduce you today to Jacqueline Twilley. And we're going to be talking about negotiating your salary. And Jacqueline is an expert in that and negotiation generally. She's the founder of Zero Gap. It's a training and a development firm, but it specializes in leadership curriculum for women who work in male-dominated industries. So I'm sure you're not surprised that I was attracted to Jacqueline and just had to get her on here for you. She holds an MBA in leadership uh, from Tiffin University, and she is a two-time Amazon best-selling author, including her books on negotiation. So you have to check that out, and we'll make sure to let Jacqueline tell you all about those and put them in the show notes as well, so you can make sure to check out those resources. But I love that Jacqueline's mission in life has been to eliminate the gender wage gap. She teaches women to negotiate so that they don't have to end up leaving that all-important money on the table, and she provides leadership resources to help women not only reach but thrive in in top position. So tell me, Jacqueline, welcome first. It's so great to have you here. Thank you so much, Cindy. I appreciate the invitation to be a guest. and I'm really excited for this conversation. Yeah, it's been way too long. I've been looking forward to connecting with you. I think our missions are really similar. So I just love that. And why don't you start by telling us, you know, how did you come to do this work and to feel so passionately about the subject? Yeah, so it was really when I was working at the Center for Disease Control and Global Immunization that I stumbled upon this women's professional development event and it was equal pay day. And I naively thought, oh, that doesn't apply to me because I have an MBA. <laughs> and it was something about the data that was shared that night that sparked a big curiosity in me. And from that curiosity, I started digging in and doing my own research and I realized I too was a victim of the wage gap yeah. and it lit a fire in my gut so strong that it changed <laughs> the trajectory of my life. I love that. I love that. And I love you've really touched on an important point, which is a thinking like, oh, well, I've got an MBA. This doesn't apply to me because it surprised me when I was researching for my book as well. A lot of people assume, oh, easy for you to say, Cindy, because for lawyers, obviously, you're used to advocating. So you guys advocate for yourself. And uh, it's same experience, Jacqueline. It was amazing. The statistics on female attorneys, we have such a huge disparity uh, yeah. And a gap in those wages at and at the partnership level. So few women hold equity partnership positions in law firms, and we're out there advocating for others, and yet we clearly aren't advocating for ourselves. So totally resonates with me. So I know you're on a mission to eliminate the gender wage gap. So let's talk about, why don't you start talking about some of the reasons that you believe it exists? Like, where does it come from? Why is this still an issue in this day and age? Yeah, you know, there's so many things in our society that are passed on from year to year in companies in our society that started for a reason. And then over the years, we forgot why those things were in place. And those unspoken, unwritten norms perpetrate the gender wage gap. So we know from research and a lot of data that one of those factors is access to family care and child care yeah. because women typically take on caregiving responsibilities for children, but not just children, elder care too, yeah. even for their in-laws. And so we also saw that in 2020, you know, how that really impacted a lot of women forcing them out of the workplace. So that's one factor. And then we have these other factors where even jobs that are similar in title are uh, really have this wage gap. So um, most people say, well, it doesn't happen for high school workers like you shared with lawyers, but definitely happens with lawyers and doctors. It even happens all the way down to women who are housekeepers. So when we think about housekeepers and janitors, very similar work, but janitors typically get paid more. That's typically a male dominated position. Yeah. So, so those little nuances factor in, and then you have additional factors such as penalties for mothers. So when they take a maternity leave, then some type of way companies have thought that, oh, well, they're not working, so they didn't put in the same time. So that um, amount of wages needs to be deducted or they have to work longer to get the equitable rates. And yeah. then another factor is Sometimes women don't ask. And then what I find the most curious piece of that is 
part of the wage gap is unexplained. And that's the part that really puzzles me and sometimes keeps me up at night is trying to dig through what's that small portion that's unexplained, because if we can figure out that root, then we can address it. And then, of course, we know some of this is discrimination. So yeah. there's so many factors that contribute to the wage gap, which means there are many solutions. And that's why I specifically focus on leadership as well as negotiation. I love that. I love that. And I'm so glad that you raised the issue about women asking as well. It's one of the areas where I find I have to do a lot of work. And it amazed me again, the studies on it show, you know, 62% of men who are presented with that first salary offer will negotiate to try and get more on the table as compared to only 7% of women like that shocked me that was staggering and you yeah. know a lot of the big corporations when they're asked about the gender disparity in their wages you know you can tell they're genuinely perplexed it's, some of it is overt discrimination i think a lot of it is that unconscious gender bias for oh, some yeah. of them articulated but a lot of them are genuinely perplexed and are like these guys asked right so just getting women over that to where they start asking for what they want and deserve is uh and I know that's one of the things you work on as well. So um, why don't you tell me what are some of the ways that you sort of encourage women to step into asking more for what they want? Yeah, it's such a big mindset game. And so what I typically have women do is think back to their childhood, because a lot of these norms where we don't ask goes back to how we were taught in grade school to just sit there and wait to <laughs> be spoken to our you have to ask permission for this. And with negotiation, you don't have to ask permission to negotiate. You can simply negotiate. So yeah. I have them think back to the first moments in their life where they can remember, where they were told, you have to wait until someone speaks to you or calls on you for you to be able to make your request. Because that unlocking that piece and going back to that childhood is a big mindset shift, right? Of saying, oh, I don't have to wait. I can make my aspirations known. So that's one thing. And so then we walk through this exercise where I teach them to think about themselves the way they would talk to their best girlfriend, right? They would pump their best girlfriend up and say, you know what? You walk straight in there in your best outfit with your best hairdo, your favorite perfume, and you present yourself with confidence. Oh, we can hype our girlfriends up all day long. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> we got to do the same things for ourselves. So those are the mindset shifts. And then I have this book that I highly recommend by Dr. Carol Dweck. She's written a book on mindset, The New Psychology of Success. And she unpacks the fixed mindset and the growth mindset. She mm. gives a lot of tips to move from the fixed mindset of I can't do this to I haven't done this yet yet being that powerful word Love and that. then once we get the mindset piece all uh starting to unpack and unlock those mindset beliefs then we can get into techniques on negotiation Love it. I absolutely love that. And I love when you were talking before, it struck me too about those, um, the different positions that are considered typically female versus male positions like janitor versus housekeeper. And as you were saying that, it struck me too about teachers, right? Because for oh, yeah. so long, it was, uh, you know, I mean, predominantly females as teachers. And it was interesting to me that as men started getting into the profession more, suddenly, and I don't know if this was your experience in your area as well, but all of a sudden these men were getting put on the fast track to the principal stream. Whereas Absolutely. these women who had dominated the industry for, you know, decades, generations, were still being kept back. But oh my goodness, we've got men in here. We better start fast tracking them along the path. I don't know if that's been your experience as that well. That has definitely been the experience that I've noticed. Um, I've seen teachers who were teacher of the year multiple years, women who are phenomenal educators, and they just keep getting the awards, right? And then a two-year male teacher, who's also a really great second-year teacher, yeah. is now assistant principal. Yeah. <laughs> and it's like, okay, same school, you have this person who has demonstrated her value and her commitment to the community and education, but we're just going to give her this gold star and this trophy and plaque and sit her here. Yeah. And this guy who has potential, right, 
he gets fast tracked. That's something we yeah. see a lot with men. They get promoted on potential, whereas women have to prove themselves over and over again. And that's why negotiation is so important. Women have to take their career and their control and say, you know what? I'm putting my name in the hat. I'm not going to sit back and wait for somebody to recognize me and say, oh, we should put you up for administrator. I'm going to make my case and negotiate my own career success. Yeah. Beautiful transition on that, Jacqueline, because that's so true. I mean, they say that, you know, men who have only 20% of the qualifications for a job are 80% more likely to apply for it than a woman who has 80% of the qualifications for the job, which is kind of a scary statistic. So why don't you tell us what are some of the ways that we can start to eliminate that gap? I know that you do a lot of incredible work in that. So what are some tips you've got about how we start eliminating that gap? Yeah, so one of the things that I think about when I think about the complexity of this problem is what are the tangible things we can do today to put a dent in it that will then turn into a wave? Yeah. So the first thing is advocating for yourself. And so this looks different for everyone, but one of the common themes that I've seen for women is shying away from praise. Again, going back to societal norm where women have to be humble. Yeah. So the first step to closing the gap is recognizing your own value, because when you know your value, you can communicate that to others. Yeah. So very practically, when a woman gets a compliment at work, instead of saying, oh, no big deal, that was <laughs> easy, I can do it in my sleep, take a step back and say, thank you for recognizing that. Absolutely. I pride myself on doing this well. It feels great to be recognized for my contributions. So that simple language change goes from devaluing, saying, oh, don't thank me, to a value-added statement of, thanks for recognizing the contributions I make. Love so it. then when that type of language shift happens, let's say you go to your performance review. Now you're in a position to say, well, thank you for recognizing when I did yeah. X, Y, and Z, the value I added. I'd like to talk to you about my career progression based on my passion and my skill set and the value I've been adding, I'd like to be considered for XYZ role. And of course, I'd love the appropriate salary to go along with that. <laughs> so I don't have to worry about money. I can just focus on getting the job done. Yeah. So simple, tangible things like that, that's one way to move the needle. Beautiful. That's how you begin to negotiate every day for your career success. And it's not a formal thing. It's these very subtle changes that change the tide in how that value is perceived. Because I firmly believe if we're going to ask any employer for more money, we've got to tell them the value that we add and build that business case. And that's the easiest way to do it. Now, there are some other things that you can do to close that gap as well. So share this information with others. You know, we cannot keep negotiation secrets, the best kept secrets in the world that only a few people know about. We've got to teach our nieces, our little cousins, yeah. the young girls that we mentor in the college age, we got to teach them out of the gate because we know from research, women who don't negotiate starting at their first job stand to lose over a half a million dollars over the course of their yeah. careers. Yeah. So as more mature women, when we learn about these strategies, we have to make it our business to prevent younger women from making the same mistake. That is one of the most impactful ways we can close the wage gap is teaching young women not to leave money on the table because that compound interest from performance reviews, from bonuses, yeah. from 401k matches, that all adds up. And that compound interest that you can get from your early 20s is something that's very hard to make up when you get later in life. I love and that. So I want to pop there, but I get so passionate about this part, Cindy. Well, I love it. I want you to keep going, but I want to dig in on that for just a minute because I think that you've hit on something really important there, which is this idea about women sort of shying away from that negotiations and how important, because I agree with you. I think all of life is a negotiation. You know, whether you're negotiating with your kids, your intimate partner, a multi-million dollar deal, certainly our salary and compensation. And yet we don't do it because a lot of women shy away from negotiation because they say they don't like the conflict or they think it's all about toughness. 
And for me, and I'd be really interested in your thoughts on this, Jacqueline, like I, the epiphany for me, because I was an attorney for 30 years and I brought that very, you know, I felt like I needed to because of that deep conditioning, as you say, that, oh, if I'm going to be successful, success is defined in negotiation and that toughness. So I got to get scrappier. And there's a high cost that comes with that. And the more I dug in, I recognized that really the key skills that make the most effective negotiators, ironically, are traits that people would consider feminine. And yet we don't believe that women are great negotiators when five out of six of the traits are traits that are those soft skills, rapport building, empathy, flexibility, intuition, trust, universally recognized as key skills to be a great negotiator. And yet we somehow devalue women. So I'd love you to speak to that issue about women who kind of shy away from negotiating or alternatively bring that overcompensating energy as I did for many years um, to the table, thinking that that's the only way to succeed. What are, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I think you're absolutely right. I know that for sure, right? And research backs that up. When I was writing my first book, one of the things I was thinking about a lot was how media really influences how we think about our careers and movies tv shows even news reports what we see is this harsh rash if you want to be successful you got to be the toughest now you you cannot be kind and empathetic because the nice woman the nice guy they get the short end of the stick right so yeah. that unconsciously plays in our mind what we found from Stanford University's research, Dr. Margaret Neal has done some phenomenal research. And what she learned is that women are excellent negotiators when it comes to representational negotiation, yeah. right? But when it comes to negotiating for themselves, <laughs> here comes the split, the switch that kicks on that's like, oh, I, I have to be so bashful and humble and I have to shy away. But when we're doing it for a team member, a company, a family, a friend, our, we really put on our hat and we lean into all of those natural skills that are typical to women and we get the job done in an excellent manner and we feel great and proud about it. But it's when we put ourselves at the center of those negotiations is when we sometimes have the problem of saying, oh, whoa, like, can I be important, right? Yeah. Can I really stand in this success and do this for myself? So Margaret Neal says that, think of it as if you are negotiating for someone else. Yeah. Um, when you're negotiating your salary, think about your family, think about your pets, whatever <laughs> makes you tick, put that in the back of your head. And that has been proven to help women really move the needle. But it's, it's really, it goes down to mindset. It goes back to unlocking our cultural norms and these unconscious things that we've picked up generation after generation. Yeah. Oh, so important. Such gold there. Absolutely. And it's funny, it goes back to what you're saying as well. I think it's that combination about owning our value and owning our worth and tied to that, this idea that, you know, good girls are supposed to be quiet. We're supposed to be the givers, the nurturers. And as early as kindergarten, right, you get those messages, young boys get their status from making themselves larger than life. And young girls, as early as kindergarten, realize they get shunned. There's social shunning if you make yourself too big. So I know for yeah. me, one of the things I do with my clients is this brag list. And it, I thought of it as soon as you were saying about that owning your value and having women step into that about the I love the girlfriend one that's gorgeous because it's true we do yeah. do that for our girlfriends we'll boost them up and prop them up and yet for ourselves, it's like oh this old thing like we can't even receive compliments let alone right we want so I have them start a brag list I give them a journal and I make them sit down and write 25 things that they love about themselves and read it every night before you go to bed and you're you have to challenge yourself to add to it every single day to just start stepping into that value stepping into oh. that worth right so i love that piece um so what are some i know you'd said you'd started to say a couple about how to eliminate the gap and i, I cut you off because i wanted to dig into that idea about seeing the so-called feminine traits as being a weakness as opposed to your greatest strength and asset right so yeah. feel free to carry on with the uh eliminate the gap if you had some other tips that i'd uh cut you off on yeah, so a couple of other ways to eliminate the gap is by doing research. Information is power. The more you know, the better informed decisions you can make. 
I don't know how many times, Cindy, I've been in a position to say, well, if I would have known that, I would have made a different decision, right? And that translates for a lot of women as well. So when you're eliminating the gap, the more you can learn about your industry, the history, the nuances, the history of women in your industry, the better you are able to navigate those challenges and close the gap. Now, that's also important to, when we're thinking about closing the gap, it's not just about money. It's about the total compensation package. So being able to tap into the data on what is available in a total compensation package and negotiating for all of those items, things such as an increased 401k match, yeah. summer child care assistant. One of the major things that's popping up right now that's really shaping the economic future of women is student loan repayments. We yeah. know that women are getting more degrees than men in this time in history. Yeah. And that means a lot of them are taking on debt. So to change the wage gap and to put more money in their pockets at the end of the day, having that student loan repayment, not just tuition reimbursement is a game changer, yeah. as well as having that childcare support. And so those are some of the things that women can think about. Now, on a different side of some people say, don't talk about politics, that's not important. But what we have to realize when it comes to the gender wage gap, there are so many constructs yeah about how our world operates um, legally, our laws and policies, that if we had more women at the political table creating bills and legislation, yeah. some of those things could really impact the wage gap, such as pay transparency. So what we saw in Massachusetts, specifically in the city of Boston, they started this wave of saying that employers could no longer require a potential employee to disclose their previous job history uh, or their current job history, their pay history. So they've been tracking the data. And what it's done is it's really leveled the playing field. Because we know the gender wage gap exists, what this has been able to do is it's been able to give women the opportunity to not say how much they've been underpaid before and therefore just get a few extra thousand dollars and let them be happy with it. It's significantly raising their base pay as well as their bonuses. And it's leveling the wage gap for so many. It's starting to pick on in a lot of states. So when we look at the gender wage gap, we do have to be stewards and be very conscious that while politics can seem nasty and very stressful right now in this moment of, in history, we have to be aware that these are things that can change the amount of money that's in our pocketbook, specifically pay transparency. Love it. Oh my gosh. Powerhouse on this. I love it. And I, as you're speaking, it made me think, and I would really love your input on this as well, because I agree with you that we need to start getting more intentional about having women in these positions who can start, you know, who have this lived experience and can be recognizing and starting to make these shifts. And having said that, I'd love your feedback on, because I think one of the problems, you know, we talk about breaking the glass ceiling in the corporate world. And I think for so long, at least, you know, my perception of it, Jacqueline, is a lot of the women who were able to break through that so-called glass ceiling, but we're doing it coming from that still more traditional masculine competitive model instead of leaning into their feminine strength. And instead of reaching a hand down to help other women up, they, you know, I often joke and say they hired a professional glazier to come in and close the ceiling off again. And then we'd have these women in positions, but we weren't, they weren't bringing that mindset shift with them. So I'd love your thoughts on that. And whether you think today, maybe I'm just being hopeful, Pollyanna optimistic, but I feel a shift. I think COVID oh, yeah. really exacerbated that people are open to a new way of being and recognizing these soft skills as being really strong indicators of leadership. What are your thoughts on that? I wholeheartedly agree. You know, there was these few women who made it to the top. And I think when we look at the history of laws, going back to laws and policies, it was PC, it was the norm just to have one or a few women. Yeah. And so there was these finite positions. So out of survival, women had to do what they had to do, right? They yeah. had to say, 
okay, I got my spot. I got to keep it. I got to provide for my family, you know? And so um, what happened is we did see this wave of women making it to the top and then really not pulling other women up. But I don't blame the women for that. I blame those societal norms that put those constraints and the pressure on the women because, you know, if I had to protect my family versus everybody's family in the world, I would choose my family first. And then once my family was okay, then I would try to help others. (laughs) And I think that's what those women had to face. Like, am I going to take food off of my family's table, not pay for my kid's education and move to the side? And it was a very difficult position to be in. I see the shift as well. I see many more women knocking down barriers saying, you know what, enough is enough. And data proves that when we have more diversity at the table, our companies will be stronger. Our countries will be stronger. We saw that in 2020, the the women who were leading and negotiating were kicking butt and really doing an awesome job for the people that they lead. And so those skills translate uh, into how we negotiate. When we really lean into our empathy, when we really lean into community, compassion, and the forward thinking, strategic thinking, and we bring everybody into the table and hear everyone's voices, we're able to hear all of the interests and then really get to some awesome negotiation where no one walks away feeling like they got the short end of the stick and really starting to change the tide and say, you know what, I want to do business with her. And we see women saying, not only will you do business with me, I'm going to introduce this other woman to you as well. And you can do business with her too. Absolutely. I love it. And so much of that. And again, as you say, Jacqueline, we can understand. I mean, it's not long ago, women didn't have the right to vote or hold property or credit. And there were so few positions at the table that I think it created this incredible scarcity mindset. So I'm really a big fan now of just inviting there is an abundant, you know, have that abundance mindset. There is our limitless opportunities when you're open yourself up to it. And, you know, a rising tide lifts all boats. So the more we help each other, the more we support, yeah. it's not a finite pie that you're competing for. The more we do that, the pie will just keep getting bigger and bigger as we support each other. I, I just, I, I love that concept. So, yeah, I, I absolutely love that. I also want to piggyback on because I know a lot of women fall into, they just want to be nice. Yeah. And sometimes it's a double edged sword, right? It's not just about being nice. It's about being wise. Yeah. And it's about you can't help everyone and you can't not have boundaries, right? You have to have proper boundaries. I love the work of Dr. Henry Cloud. Boundaries at Work is one of my favorite books. And so you have to exercise wisdom when you're doing this. You know, we have a finite amount of time and a finite amount of energy that we spend each day. So we have to be wise and say, if I'm gonna spend my time and energy doing things, I wanna make sure it's with other women who have the same values that I have. And I'll help this woman for maybe six months or nine months, and then maybe I'll take a break and recharge. And then I'll help maybe two women for six months. But don't try to bring on superwoman complex because that's what leads to burnout, right? So I feel like women, we get polarized. We want to do either nothing, like I got my spot, you get yours, or we try to do everything. And we have to find that middle ground where it's a good flow for us, where we don't reach burnout. So I believe this phrase wholeheartedly, you can't pour from an empty cup. You got to make sure your cup is full so that you can give that overflow to everyone else and really give that intention to support other women's growth. I love that. Absolutely. And I think part of that as well is recognizing that you can be assertiveness is one of those six key, you know, I mentioned rapport building, empathy, flexibility, intuition, and trust, and also assertiveness is that six key trait. And I think a lot of women end up Um, either shying away going oh I don't want to I have to be nice and recognize assertiveness isn't the same as aggressive you can be really firm and assertive you can have those boundaries you can stand your ground and you can still do it in a way that comes from compassion and because assertiveness really just comes from confidence which comes from knowledge and knowledge comes from preparation so as you said do the preparation, have, you know, get, do your homework, do a little bit of research, and then come from that place of assertiveness as well. And speaking of that, how important do you think preparation is in negotiations? I think that 80% of your negotiation is your prep. Yeah. 
I write about this in my uh, book because information is power. I know I said this a few minutes ago, but the more you know, the better informed decisions you can make. Yeah. And it's all about preparing so that you can make the best informed decision. And that's what negotiation is about, taking the information available and reaching an agreement that both parties can agree to. And also, you know, being wise enough to know when you have to walk away because negotiation is not about getting all the things all the time. Sometimes you got to pump the brakes and maybe revisit months or years later. So that information is critical. I have this method that I created, Cindy. It's the latte negotiation method. It's five steps. And step number one is look at the details. And that really centers around preparation, uncovering as much information as you can up front so that as you go into it, you know what questions to ask. You know when to zip your lips and listen a little bit more intently. You know when to share and when to not share as much. And that art, that finesse in that negotiation really comes from having enough information and data that you pull from that preparation phase, whether it's online data, talking to people who've done business with this company or this individual, or just really studying the marketplace and the industry and looking at market trends, that type of information is a game changer. And the most successful negotiators that I've worked with, they spend a lot of time not trying to wing it, but trying to get as much information to make informed decisions. I, give us a little teaser for the rest of that latte um, formula. I love that idea. So look into the details. That's the L, I assume. What, what, what yes. does the other one stand for? So A is anticipate challenges. So don't just stop there, but think about your response to a challenge so that you don't make the mistake that I've made too many times saying, you know what, I should have said this <laughs> or that right? So number three is think about your walk away point. Mm -hmm. And you want to do that before you get emotionally invested. Number four, talk it through. And that's really role playing, hearing how you sound, recording yourself on video, especially when it's um, a negotiation you're not really comfortable with. Your body language says a lot. So you want to record yourself role playing so you know about those communication cues that you're sending that aren't verbal. And then um, number five is evaluate the options. And this is one that I find really important for women. A lot of times we find ourselves negotiating where we're in a um, make it or break it moment. We got to get out of this job. We got to make more money. And so when we get an offer, sometimes we say, even though it's not what I want, I'll just take it for now and I'll figure it out later. And women really have to get to the point of knowing their value so much so that they're willing to walk away and evaluating those options based on the facts and not the immediate feelings that may be stressing them out. Love it. That is awesome. I love that. What a great goal. And again, for everybody out there, you're going to want to read. This is one of those episodes you're going to want to re-listen, re-watch, and be able to catch all of those details. So you've given us a bunch already, but what do you have any other sort of strategies to negotiate higher salaries? I know that's an incredible specialty of yours that you've helped so many women to. So what are, what are some of those strategies to negotiate those higher salaries? Yeah, so I'm going to go back to preparation. It's about finding out what is typical in this industry when that total compensation package is offered. Yeah. That's a game changer to getting a really great salary. You don't just want a good salary, you want the great salary. Yeah. So one of the tools that I like is called um, uh, Blind, B-L-I-N-D. It's an app and you have to register with your work email, but once you get in there, there's some level of anonymity. And then there's also a fishbowl app. In both of these apps, it's very community driven, a lot of professionals and people speak candidly about, oh, in my compensation package, I got X, Y, Z and this and that. And so one of the techniques is if you don't have that network cultivated and networking is such a critical component of negotiation, can't stress it enough, that you have to be able to tap into people that you know or people that you know who know someone yeah. and get that insider info so that when you get to the negotiation table, you're not just talking about dollars and cents. You're talking about everything. I work with a lot of emerging executive women leaders. And one of the things that I focus on with them is negotiating their exit package yeah. because 
it's it's like a prenup, right? Everything's great in the beginning, but then when things go sour, they go sour. Yeah. And we've seen far too many times where women leaders on their way out, they get trashed, their reputation gets slammed and it's hard to recover from. So what I really encourage women to do when it comes to negotiating their salary, also negotiate the terms of your exit up front. Yeah. Who will handle the messaging? Who will send out that initial message uh, will you keep that work cell phone number, especially if you've been there for multiple years? Like these are things that you want to keep intact because that's a part of your professional network. And then I also tell women, especially executive level women negotiating, you have to talk to an employment attorney. Don't just sign a 30, 20 something page employment agreement um, because you're excited. You need to have somebody look at it. I can't tell you how many times when things get very rocky and women are beginning to exit a company, they come to me saying, I want to negotiate. And I look at their employment agreement and I'm like, you got to call an attorney. Yeah. Who, who advised you to sign this <laughs> this way? And they're like, well, I just signed it. And I'm like, yeah, this is not my wheelhouse employment attorney. Yeah. Um, and I try to tell women that when you begin to get to those higher ranks in your career, it's worth the expense, put it in your budget that an employment attorney is reviewing those employment agreements up front because yeah. that is a part of the salary negotiation process. That exit number, how much money you get paid, even if you don't hit the metrics, that's always important. Men have no problem negotiating that. Women have this, uh, I call it the people pleasing syndrome where yep. I only want to get it if I've done all the things. No, if, if I did what I showed up to do, even if it didn't work out, I still want my money. I'm Absolutely. not leaving money on the table. <laughs> and I love that you made the analogy to the prenup. That's I use that same analogy. And it's, I don't know if you knew, but as a labor lawyer for 30 years, oh my gosh, Jacqueline, I can't tell you as well how many people come to you and they've signed off. And even the really shorter ones, like, you know, a two-page employment contract, and there it is in black and white saying that on termination, they're only entitled to the minimum employment standard uh, termination and they have no rights. Whereas otherwise, they would have been entitled to, you know, two years walk away compensation package, and they sign the rights away at the front end of that process. So now speaking, I think a lot of that comes though, because people and women in particular, I think they feel like they don't have leverage at that stage when they do. So I, I wouldn't mind you speaking to that about, you know, what a, what leverage you have at the beginning of the, the process, but also any tips for negotiating when you feel that you don't have the obvious leverage. Yeah, so when you do have the leverage, I think the biggest part here, and I've just in this last month, Cindy, I've had women who have had some amazing offers thrown at them and they want to accept that first offer yeah. because it's more than what they currently earn. Yeah. It's very rare that the first offer is the best offer. Very, very rare, mm -hmm. right? So that's one thing I try to preach and scream at the top of the mountain. <laughs> so you have power when someone is coming to you and they're telling you all these great things yeah. as women, we're like, oh, I feel so good. They recognize this. Guess what, honey? That is every green flag to ask for more. <laughs> ask for more because when they tell you, oh, we reached out to you because of this and that, every reason they give you is another point in your leverage column, okay? You just have to recognize that that's what that is. Yeah. And so for when, you're, when you have this leverage, the way that you use that is don't just say, thank you, thank you, thank you. Oh my God, thank you for picking me, which is something that I did early in my career. <laughs> Instead, ask clarifying questions, ask open-ended questions. Oh, well, I appreciate you saying that. Tell me more, why, do, why does that skill matter to you? Yeah. And how is this gonna benefit your company? That's how you get even more data, more information to use that leverage to say, oh, so what you actually want me to do is, X, Y, Z, that's this title, which means this is X, Y, Z market rate. And going back to preparation, you'll find that market rate yeah. and you can give a range. Now, let me say this, when it comes to salary, women tend to go on the bottom end of the range. If they yeah. see a, a range, they'll say, okay, it's between 120 and 165. I'm going to say 121. Yeah. Listen, <laughs> you have to set your aspirations high. Again, Dr. Margaret Neal from Stanford University, yeah. she says aspirations drive behavior. 
Okay. So set those aspirations at the high end of the range to give yourself some room to negotiate. So those are some quick things if you have some leverage. Now, if you don't have leverage, if you don't think you have leverage, the best thing to do is to ask open-ended questions. Yeah. Questions are a critical part of negotiating your career, especially your salary. So finding out how long has this position been open and why is it important to fill it now? What piece of puzzle, what does a skill set bring to the team, to the organization? And so when you're really able to unlock that information, you're able to understand how important this is. And more importantly, what problem does this solve? Yeah. When you can identify what your skill set solves for that organization, then even if you don't think you had leverage, now you have leverage because you know how you can turn, turn the tide for that organization. Love it. And that aspiration level is so important and so underutilized, right? I mean, women do tend to set much lower aspiration levels. I remember one study where they talked about women are 45% more likely to believe that they can't secure the outcomes they want. Like talk about a self-defeating proposition. How, if you're going into your negotiations already believing that you are not likely to get set those aspiration levels high and have an absolute unshakable expectation that you're also going to get it. So now what yes. advice do you have for negotiating with bullies? I, I get this question a lot. Yeah. So, you know, every bully um, has a spot in them where there is a weakness. And I think Chris Voss's work um, negotiating and all of the classes that he does in his book, he talks a lot about disarming right? When you're working with the bully, you've got to disarm them. Yeah. you got to figure out what's their trigger, what's making them become a bully or portray themselves as a bully, and then really get to that. And a lot of that can be mirroring. So when you hear them say something where you may be offensive, and I've done this myself, you know, I've had people to when I've been negotiating, try to take advantage of me. And my first instinct is to protect myself. But one of the things that you'll do over time, and this really takes practice, is to get to the root of it and figure out what is it that that person really wants. That takes a lot of patience and it takes a lot of understanding and putting yourself in the other person's shoes. This is not a skill that happens overnight for most people. Yeah. And so one of the things that I do practically to build that muscle, to sit into that uncomfortable zone and really not shut off, but try to open up is I'll watch a news program where I don't agree with their views and I'll watch maybe 30 minutes of it. <laughs> and in addition to watching it, I turn on my phone and I record myself watching it. I can't tell you how embarrassed I am watching those replays about my facial expressions, how my body cringes, how I want to yell at the TV. But when I increase my awareness of those things, then it makes me a better negotiator because then I'm able to better control my facial expressions. I'm one of those Black women who wears her face, her emotions on the face, and I will tell you off with my facial expressions without saying a word. So... I have learned to manage that by watching a news program that I don't agree with. And as a result, it's helped me to be more conscious in negotiations, especially with the bullies. Yeah, I love that. I have not heard that before. I so love recording it because again, my facial expression, oh my gosh. And I'm not aware of it until every once in a while, if I catch myself on video and I'm like, oh, good Lord, uh, super powerful video yourself while you're in that scenario. I love that. I think that's fabulous. <laughs> yes. Um, and what role do you think emotion plays in negotiating? Emotion is a powerful tool. Yeah. When I first began learning about um, negotiating, I thought that emotion was a bad thing. Stay away from emotions, don't get emotional. But emotion plays a beautiful piece in negotiation. It's about managing that emotion, right? Knowing when to show it, because there are some times where you absolutely have to show emotion, but it can't be the entire negotiation. Yeah. It has to be time 
in a way where it makes the impact and it emphasizes the point that you were making. And it has to be controlled, a controlled display of emotion. And it can be a beautiful expression of like, listen, this is, this is it. I'm not going any lower on this. Or if we can't do this, unfortunately, I'm going to have to walk away. And those are beautiful displays of emotion. Now, the younger version of myself, when I was in my early 20s, I remember I would cry at the drop of a dime when I was at work. Give me feedback that I'm not expecting. And it would just work all. <laughs> so that part of emotion, especially in a negotiation, is not helpful for anyone. Yeah. So what I learned to do was I learned to bring in a bottle of water. And I always have a glass bottle of water in any in-person negotiation. And so I picked it up from Target. Anybody can get it. And so I sip throughout. But if I feel my emotion rising, and this just comes from being very self-aware, I sip the water and I sip very slowly. <laughs> and then if I really feel that emotion coming up to the top, I'll just pause and take a restroom break. Yeah. Give myself that opportunity to cut off that energy that's flowing in that conversation. Take a couple of deep breaths, walk into the restroom, wash my hands, look at myself in the mirror, give myself a three second pep talk and walk back like I am the baddest Beyonce on the stage <laughs> and regain my power and composure. Yeah. And just sometimes you got to break that energy. Now, in this environment where it's hybrid and we're doing video and in person, I have done the same thing on a Zoom. Yep. If I feel my my face to face negotiation via Zoom getting out of control, I'll just say, I'm going to pause for a second and take a sip of water. I turn off my camera for a split second, mute my mic. And for three seconds, I take a couple of deep breaths yeah. and I get myself together. It's powerful how managing those emotions can change from derailing a negotiation to really regaining your power. Yeah. Beautiful advice, such beautiful advice. And that avoids that reactivity, right? Like I often say to people in terms of emotion, right? Bring the emotion to the table, but don't be emotional, right? So yes. and I love that it avoids that reactivity piece. Um, and and also what, one of my models, I call it the five W's I mentioned, right? But that who piece, uh, another, and I love this, take the break when you need it. Great advice. And also if you've pre-grounded as part of your prep post process, you've really thought about who do I want to be? Like, who do I want to show up as in this negotiation? You know, choose three words that will embody how you want to show up. And there's no right or wrong answer as long as you're being intentional about it, right? Maybe it's calm, collected, and compelling. Maybe it's bold and correct, whatever it is, but it allows you then to take that pause and reground yourself so that you're showing up in a way that's authentically who you and how you wanted to show up, right? So, oh yeah. Yeah. What do you see as the key reasons that negotiations fail, Jacqueline? I think key reasons why negotiation fail is our egos get inflated, right? Either party. When the ego goes unchecked, that is the number one reason where I see um, negotiations fail. Yeah. Another thing is lack of information, you yeah. know? And the third thing is assumptions. Assuming instead of being very savvy and presenting open-ended questions to get down to the truth. Yeah. And sometimes when we prepare so much, it will um, have this effect where we think we know it all. Yeah. And then we begin to make too many assumptions. So it's always important to check those assumptions at the door. And at times, you know, we have to bring in a different person. Sometimes the negotiation requires other parties to get involved. And that doesn't mean you failed. That's just a wise move sometimes. Yeah. And going back to the ego, it just sometimes we're human at the end of the day. We've got to take a step back and perhaps bring in another person or different team members to handle that negotiation. Yeah. Beautiful point. And so true. I mean, it's funny. I, I call ego one of the seven sins of negotiation or seven deadly sins of negotiating. Uh, and ego shows up in different ways for different people as well, right? I think it's funny. You talked earlier about women, about the being nice piece. And I've heard people go, oh, no, she doesn't bring any ego to the table at all. But wanting to be liked is just another way ego can show up. And it can oh, be yeah. a sin in negotiations as well. So, so I what, couldn't agree more. What do you think are the key skills that make a great negotiator, Jacqueline? 
So listening is one of the best skills that a negotiator can have. Yeah. 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 Leaning into active listening skills and really unpacking what that person is saying. Stephen R. Covey says, seek first to understand, yeah. then be understood. And if you can take that one thing into a negotiator, it can exponentially increase your success. Going back to making assumptions, the more that you can listen, the more information you'll have, the better informed decisions you can make, the less assumptions that will be out there. I've seen a lot of negotiations derail because of assumptions. Yeah. So another thing that I've seen really successful negotiators do is get creative. Thinking outside of the box, yes. you know, you and that other person at the beginning of the day, you came to the table because there was something that you wanted to exchange and they wanted to exchange. Yeah. And sometimes in the weeds that gets lost. So going back to, okay, what is it that we want? And going back to that mutual agreement and sometimes taking a pause to get there will really help you to strengthen your negotiation skills. And we talked about this before, but preparation, yeah. right? The more you know, the better informed decisions you can make. I can't stress that enough. I talk about it all the time because it's a game changer and not being the know-it-all, but just being aware enough to know the key issues that are important and then tapping into that for the creativity to think outside of the box. Love it. Great advice. I love that. So, so important. And I'm glad you mentioned listening as well. I am such an advocate and become a more so every day. The more that I do, the more that I teach, the more that I see out there. Uh, and it's funny when you said that it struck me going back even to your, the, your answer about how to deal with bullies. I think because and I so agree with you that disarming is an important strategy on that. And one of the ways that I find can be really powerful to disarm is through what I call elevated active listening. So not only do you reflect that, you know, listen, give your full attention without distraction, ask powerful questions, you know, get curious to try and find out what the other side wants, what's driving them, what are those fears, as you said, but also when you're reflecting back what they say, reflect it back in a way that's even more generous than how they characterized it. And I know it seems oh, yeah. counterintuitive to people, but it's amazing to me. You actually see, especially if you're dealing with bullies or people who are so stuck in their position, when they realize that you're re actually reflecting back their position more gracefully and eloquently than they did, there's a certain softening and opening that happens that leaves room for more creative solutions. So I love that you raised that. And I can't believe what time it is here. My gosh, we're already almost at the top of the hour. So let me just ask you quickly, what is one of the greatest mindset shifts you've ever had? Doesn't have to be about negotiation, but it can be. Oh, goodness. The greatest mind. I've had so many. Um, I will tell you, I'm going to talk about one of the affirmations one of my mentors gave me that was a transformative mindset shift for my life. And uh, I think it applies to a lot of women, especially women that I've worked with. And she says that she has to ground herself and tell herself, and I tell myself this as well, I expand in my container to receive more abundance, love, and joy. Mm -hmm. Because sometimes we can get into this place mindset-wise where it's too good to be true. Yeah. And so when we remind ourselves that we can expand in abundance, love, and joy, it can change a multitude of things. And that was one of my major mindset shifts. Oh, so beautiful. I love that. So tell us, Jacqueline, where can people find out about you? Where would you want to direct them to go to learn more about you and what you do? Yes. So my favorite place to hang out online is LinkedIn. So you can find me on LinkedIn, Jacqueline B. Twilly. Send me a invitation. Let me know you heard me on this podcast. I'd be happy to connect with you. Uh, you can find my books on Amazon, Navigating the Career Jungle, as well as Don't Leave Money on the Table, Negotiation Strategies for Women. And if I can be a resource to anyone, I would love to. And I have a request for everyone in the audience. If you found one tip helpful in this episode, leave Cindy a review of her podcast because that helps other people find the podcast in the podcast stores. And you have no idea how that ripple effect can change the tide on the gender wage gap. 
I love that. Thank you for that. That's awesome. And we'll make sure to include all of that in the show notes. So everybody do check out Jacqueline's resources and her books. They're fabulous. Lots and lots of loaded value. And make sure to share this episode, frankly. I mean, there is not a woman out there who can't benefit from learning to up-level her negotiation skills. So make sure to subscribe if you haven't already done that. Check out Jacqueline's resources. And Jacqueline, it's been such a pleasure having you here. Thank you so much for the invitation. Yeah, and that's a wrap for this episode. So until next time, go forth and negotiate your best life on your terms so that you can get more of what you want in life and stop missing out and get everything that you deserve in life from the boardroom to the bedroom. <laughs>